Sulawesi is incredibly ethnographically complicated. Okay, um, we move on then uh, to Annabel Gallup, uh, who's undoubtedly known to many of you already, uh, who uh, runs the um, Southeast Asia section in the British Library. So if you want to know anything about uh, the resources on Southeast Asia in the British Library, Annabel is the person to ask. And if you have any knowledge of any Southeast Asian seals, uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Annabel would love to hear about them. Yeah. Over to you, Annabel. Right. Thank you very much, um, William, and thank you, Christina, for organising this wonderful um, and very exciting conference. Um, just a little bit of background to my work. Um, as William mentioned, I'm curator at the British Library with responsibility for Maritime Southeast Asia, and I work on Malay manuscripts um, with a particular interest on, in documents, um, chancery practice and seals. But I also recently started working on Quran manuscripts, which historically have attracted almost no interest at all, either from historians or um, literary scholars, philologists, or even um, ethnographers, anthropologists. The reason being that the Quran is written in Arabic, which to people who work on Southeast Asia is a foreign language and, and of less interest than, say, Malay works in Malay or Javanese or Bugis or um, Tausug or anything, you know, a, a local language. And secondly, um, because the um, the text of the Quran never changes, so it's not even as if you're looking at an um, original work um, in Arabic created or written or produced by a Southeast Asian. So if um, scholars in the past, particularly even now, have come across the Quran, oh, it's just a Quran and it doesn't tend to even rate for discussion. Um, so I've been looking at Qurans, obviously not at the text, which doesn't change, um, you know, that's a different field of study, um, through, throughout the Islamic world and throughout the centuries, but at the Quran as a book and a material object that completely reflects the culture which created it, in which it was created. And through a study of the material, artistic, visual aspects of Quran manuscripts, you can tell where a manuscript comes from and what it says about influences, networks, um, connections of the places which um, produced it. And so I've, in recent years, been working on Quran manuscripts from the Philippines. Now, there's considerable literary evidence scattered over the centuries attesting to the presence of Quran manuscripts in the southern Philippines and their use in religious life. And in the early 18th century, in particular, there's a reference to Quran manuscripts having been brought into the Philippines by foreign Muslims from Mecca. Um, and it, the, the quote is, they bring Qurans in Arabic and instruct them, and, and, and instruct with them. I mean, it's actually quite, this is, it's very, very rare to get documentary evidence of the um, presence and passage and um, movement of Quran manuscripts. So for the whole of Southeast Asia, this is quite an early reference um, and extremely valuable. A century and a half later, there's a very interesting comment from Sebastian Vidal y Soler, who noted that um, each settlement in the Pulangi Valley had a Muslim priest or pandeta who generally had made the pilgrimage to Mecca, and one of his tasks was to re recite from the Quran, copies of which are guarded with great care since they dated from the 16th and 17th centuries and were heavily written in with commentaries. Again, a very, um, very engaged, very detailed um, report um, with, with more information in it than one can glean from many writings in, in English or Dutch sources for the whole of the rest of maritime Southeast Asia. And I will be returning to this particular comment um, later and another comment on the quality of the calligraphy in, in Mindanao. But despite all these comments evoking the central role of Quran manuscripts in religious life in Mindanao, until recently we had no idea what these venerable manuscripts look, might look like, for not a single one had been published. And it's really o only in the past decade that um, through a number of research projects and in publications um, that a number of Quran manuscripts from Mindanao have been documented, and to date, um, 17 have been located at present. You can see that 11 of them are held in US collections, 
four in the Philippines, all documented thanks to the work of um, Professor um, Midori Kawashima, and two in Europe. Now, all the known manuscripts in US co um, collections were acquired in conditions of armed conflict only in the first decades of the 20th century, and the two in Europe, in Berlin and in Bristol, were both known to be have been acquired in the 1920s and 30s and might have derived from the same sources. Um, I'm certain that in US collections in particular, there must be many more which are undiscovered. The one in Charlottesville, for example, I just came across by serendipity on Twitter, um, you know, a few months ago. But that's how one finds these things um, these days. Um, so I described some of these Qur'ans in two articles published in 2011, looking at Qur um, Mindanao Qur'an manuscripts um, held in U.S. collections, which was published in the online journal on Mindanao, Our Own Voice, and in an article in collaboration with um, Midori um, Kawashima in 2012. But at that time, my research was entirely based on photographic evidence. I'd been sent digital images, and I described the Qur'ans from those digital images. Um, but since then, in the intervening years, I've been lucky enough to have actually um, been able to inspect personally nine of these 17 manuscripts um, in Washington, D.C., Charlottesville, Bristol, and Manila. And seeing and handling manuscripts is essential for a better understanding of the material features. And so it's really only now I feel in a position to say a bit more authoritatively something about the art of the Quran in Mindanao. So overall, Quran manuscripts from Mindanao fit fairly and squarely into the broad family of Quran manuscripts of the Malay world, maritime Southeast Asia, Nusantara, whatever you like to call it. These manuscripts are all generally rather plain, with each page containing around 15 lines of text, could be 13, 17, usually an odd number, written in black ink and set within ruled text frames. Verses are separated with small round circles drawn with a compass, which may be colored in. Divisions of the Quranic text into juz or 30 parts of equal length are often indicated in the margins through a variety of um, graphic effects and further divisions of the Jews, i.e. this 30th division, into half, quarters and eighths may also be indicated. As you can see on the right here, um, it's the Thumman, it's an eighth of a Jews, which is indicated with a nice um, um, f f foliate ornament. So this is the manuscript which is in, in Virginia, the University of Virginia Library. Now, some manuscripts in Quran manuscripts in the southern Philippines, as elsewhere in the Malay world, have decorated double frames at key locations in the text. These frames usually frame the first two pages, the opening of the Quranic text, and this particular um, manuscript is sort of the you know the archetypal um, Philippine Quran. It's the Quran of Bayang, which is very well known by now. It's um, there's a long story about it, and I advise you to read um, Midori's 2012 book for the full story of how this manuscript was captured um, in Bayang in 1910, I think, is that right? 1910, 1908 or something, taken to America, um, spent some decades in Chicago, was returned to Manila, um, was um, going to be returned to Mindanao, and uh, um, a storm diverted it. It went into Malacanang Palace and disappeared from view. And um, re uh, after the end, after the um, um, People Power Revolution, um, complete, nothing was known of it. But it's finally um, re-emerged, and I understand is now um, designated the national treasure in the National Museum. So this, these are the opening pages. Um, these key frames are also found um, sometimes at the end of the manuscript, and so this is another manuscript from Mindanao showing the decorated frames at the end. And some of the finest or the most well-decorated manuscripts have frames in the middle, which might, which um, interestingly is not always in the same location. So this is one of the manuscripts in um, the Smithsonian. It marks the beginning of the Surat al-Isra, but. In a couple of other manuscripts, you find a different surah um, in the Quran marked, and this is the Surat al Kaf um, marked in the middle of the manuscript. Now, um, all these decorated frames that I've um, shown 
bear witness to the overarching influence of what in another publication I've called the Sulawesi diaspora geometric style of Quranic manuscript art, which is characterized by strictly geometrical constructs using horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines and um, circles and part circles. So what you don't get is the sort of sinuous lines and ogival arches, which you get in, in many other parts of um, Southeast Asia. So the lines are always, um, they're, you know, they're straight lines and the, and the round bits are sort of, are, are geometric circles. The influence of this Sulawesi school is felt all over the Malay archipelago. So it's not unique to find the influence in, um, in Mindanao. And I wouldn't suggest that it's, it, it speaks of a, of a particularly strong Sulawesi link because you find the Sulawesi influence all over. And here's an example of a Quran which was copied in Kedah in 1757, and it's now held in the Sultan's Mosque in Riau, so showing the networks that existed then, but also the extent of Sulawesi influence. Um, but of, but it, what, nonetheless, it was of a special interest in me um, when Elsa Clave shared a photograph she had taken um, in a of a collection of manuscripts in um, near Davao in Mindanao in 2007, and this Quran manuscript is re even though it doesn't show the decorated frames, it's recognisably an absolutely standard um, Sulawesi Quran manuscript of the same ilk as the one in um, in Penyanga now, um, and so it does show that. Um, Sulawesi style Qurans were at some time in the past present in Mindanao. And so the, the connections and the influences are very well, are, are quite clear. Um, but visually impressive, so some, though some of these Mindanao Qurans are, I wouldn't say that there is a distinctive Mindanao style of manuscript illumination. Rather, the Mindanao identity is manifest in certain details and nuances as first outlined in my 2012 article, and I have no reason to change that opinion now, namely a particular emphasis on the vegetal scroll, the foliate scroll you see filling in the um, borders around the text. Um, and this emphasis on the scroll the motif is perhaps sort of more marked in Mindanao than elsewhere in Southeast Asia. There are certainly occasional unusual features, for example, in this manuscript in the Smithsonian. I think this is one of the finest examples of um, decorated frames I've seen from, um, from Mindanao. Um, we see some ornaments in solid black pigment. Now that's absolutely very unusual indeed. I've never seen it anywhere else in Southeast Asia where it's black is usually only present in the form of black ink to outline um, other sort of um, colored elements. Another very small decorative motif which is so far only seen in Mindanao is um, even in sort of rather simpler Qur'ans occasional placement of tendrils or foliate motifs in the corners of the decorated frame. So that's another what you could call a Mindanao feature. However, in this presentation, I'd like to focus on some more strikingly unique features of Mindanao Quran manuscripts, which relate to the materiality and use of the book rather than its decoration. Now, the first of this is covers of solid pieces of wood, jointed by means of small drilled holes through which string is threaded to hold the pieces of wood together. So this is unique in Southeast Asia. No other Southeast Asian manuscript tradition has manuscripts with covers of solid wood, apart from, say, Batak manuscripts. But I'm talking about the Islamic manuscript tradition and Quran manuscripts. So this is um, the same example, which is opened out. And you can see how um, this, the string is threaded through the holes. And this particular example in Virginia has got some decorative motifs on it. So, so far there are four of these manuscripts out of these 17 are definitely known to have wooden covers. Because the covers are not joined to the manuscript, they work as a protective outer cover, it's entirely possible that many more had these covers which have now been lost. But these are the other three examples. So the, the manuscript in Bristol at the top, and you can, still, you can see also the joints um, and the threads here. Um, one, these two are in Mindanao. This is now covered with um, a, an, a cloth wrapper. And this sad, um, in a very sorry state, a very important Quran, 
which is now um, in total fragments, but it still has its cover. Anyway, so that is a unique feature of um, Mindanao Quran manuscripts. The other distinctive feature I'd like to um, focus on relates to the paper used. Most Southeast Asian Quran manuscripts are written on high quality European paper. Um, although in Java, you do get Duluang, which is a locally made um, paper from the beaten bark of the mulberry tree. Of, but of the Mindanao Qurans, only three of the 17 are written on European paper. Four are written on Chinese paper. Now, Chinese paper is and was very widely used in Southeast Asia. It's not watermarked like European paper, so it's more difficult to identify. But one of the most characteristic features is the presence of visible brush strokes across the surface because the paper was made um, in the Chinese method uh, elsewhere using um, an aqueous solution and a paper mold on which um, sheets of paper were formed from the aqueous um, solution. When the paper drained out, the paper was lifted and pasted against a wall using, and using brushes. Um, they were, it was pasted onto a wall to dry. And this, the, the, what you can see, these kind of striations are the strokes from the brush in the drying process. And it's one of the key features of which identify paper as Chinese paper. And so that's quite a, um, a, quite a useful way of finding out. Um, but in a... Um, what we also find in some manuscripts from Mindanao is Chinese paper stamps, and these are the marks of the Chinese paper maker. And Midori has found these in other non-Quranic manuscripts in Mindanao. And this is the means by where I found this Quran in Virginia, because there was a Twitter conversation about these Chinese paper stamps. <laughs> and interestingly enough, you for the you never get, as you know, it, um, figural decoration in Chinese um, paper stamp, in, in Quran manuscripts. But it just so happens that the golden lion seal is stamped on this Quran, which I think makes it one of only two exceptions I've ever found <laughs> of a figural illustration in a, in a um, Quran manuscript. Um, but the most interesting um, to, um, finding in terms of paper is that over half, nine of the 17 manuscripts um, or Quran manuscripts of Mindanao are written on what appears to be a locally made fibrous paper. Now, this is a very important because to date there has been no evidence at all of the making of paper in any Islamic manuscript culture in Southeast Asia. Javanese paper, the Dluang, which I mentioned earlier, it technically um, does not qualify as paper because it's not made from an aqueous solution. It's simply sheets of tree bark which are pounded and polished until they form a writing surface. But the definition of paper is um, a, sub, a writing support made from an, um, a, an aqueous solution which is then made into sheets and dried. And so it seems to be that in the, Philipp the Philippines is the only Islamic manuscript culture in Southeast Asia which made paper. Um, even in, a, most, in a, a recent book on paper in the Philippines um, by Thomas, I've only, which um, I was alerted to by Mindori, I've only seen references to the 20th century making of paper, but these manuscripts are date at least to the 18th, 19th century and possibly even earlier. So I think there's really um, a big area of study there. Um, it is very easily, it's, it's quite crude, you can see the surface, it's very fibrous, but you can also see that the shape of the mold, you can, I, I probably, but you can actually see that the lines of the mold, um, ever, and once you know what you're looking for, it's then very easy to identify it when you come across it. Um, so finally, the last um, aspect I would like to talk about um, in these Quran manuscripts is the, they, they, they bear witness to a very close engagement with the text. I mean, so Sebastian Vidal mentioned, you know, heavily written in with commentaries. And there's certainly many of the Qurans have quite a lot of annotation. You get um, showing, um, testifying to a close reading of the text. When um, words have been left out, you can see they've been inserted or sometimes the spelling is corrected when it hasn't been correct before. 
The other thing that the manuscripts testify to is despite the very poor condition they are found in today, no doubt um, related to the fact that they were captured in armed, um, in armed conflict, many of the manuscripts show signs of very great care and um, efforts at restoration and repair in the past. So you can see that these old tears have been sewn to repair them in this manuscript. And this is in a different manuscript. So it's uh, sewing repairs was obviously one technique that was used. Another technique that was used was pasting over tears. So in this manuscript on the left hand side, you can see a tear which is now made whole because on the right hand side, this is the reverse of the same folio, a paper patch has been put there and, and fixed with adhesive and presumably the, the adhesive was white or transparent at, at the time, but it has now blackened. It's probably some sort of resinous adhesive. And you see this feature in many manuscripts, many evidence of, repair, um, of, of repairing manuscripts. Manuscripts, of course, do get um, battered and pages get lost, especially from the beginning. So another thing you can see in a number of these Quran manuscripts is the replacement of pages, so especially at the beginning. So this is a Quran, which is a very fine Quran, which has lost um, about five pages at the beginning. And these have been r restored um, in a much less competent hand. But nonetheless, it shows you that this Quran was designed to be read whole, and even the replacement pages, um, one of them was, was decorated. Um, it's lost the first page. This would have been the, um, the, the left-hand side of, the, of a main page. And this same situation, so it doesn't just happen once, but in the Quran at Bri from Bristol, you can see those are the original pages of the bulk of the Quran on the left, and the um, additional and the new replacement first two pages which have been added on. So um, I'm coming to the end now, I, and I'm going back to the quote by Sebastian Vidal about he mentioned Qurans dating from the 16th and 17th century. Now, no Quran in Southeast Asia has yet been identified from the 16th century. Even the 17th century is very early. Most of the Qurans I've shown you here probably date from the 19th or 18th century. But there's one manuscript in the Smithsonian that seems to be on paleographic grounds, on a, a, from, a, from the appearance of the handwriting alone, to be considerably older than the others. Um, the, decor the decorative elements um, are later additions, but the hand itself um, bears some resemblance to Javanese Quran manuscripts of the 17th century. And this is another heavily repaired manuscript um, with lot and with, the, with lots of later editions. So in conclusion, um, Mindanao Qur'an sit firmly within the larger family of Southeast Asian Qur'an manuscripts, but there are certain unique aspects of the material culture, and the books themselves bear witness to particularly careful usage and care through the centuries um, with evidence of repair and restoration. But finally, I'd like to reflect that just 10 years ago, not a single Qur'an from Mindanao had yet been published. But today, that same complete dearth of information applies to Sulu. Not a single Quran manuscript from Sulu is known. I don't know what they look like. I don't know if they're going to be, I'm going to find that they're similar to Mindanao Qurans or reflecting a completely different tradition. So, I mean, we live in hope. You know, so much has been found in the past 10 years. Um, and we look forward to sort of more coming up in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if any of you know of any Qurans, please uh, contact Annabelle. Yes, a quick question at the back as we change over. Midori. Thank you, Annabelle. It's such an interesting um, presentation. I was intrigued by one word which you mentioned, which is Sulu. Um, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a
I don't know the exact etymology, but pandita is certainly a loan word in Malay. Um, in contemporary usage in, uh, in Indonesian, pandita tends to refly, ref, um, refer more to a Christian priest. In, um, so and I would, once, would simply need to go back into the context. I'm not suggesting that the holy men themselves used that word, but it was applied to them. But it's a loan word in Malay, which is the um, lingua franca of the whole of the um, archipelago. But it would be interesting to work out its first usage and to see to whom, whether it was applied generically to, um, you know, pr priests of, of any of the, of, the, um, of, the, of the great, you know, religions or whether it was, um, you know, when the meaning sort of began to travel. Um, Muslims in uh, Champa in Vietnam use the term guru, uh, so we get this uh, as well, um, this uh, migration of terms. Okay, so